so it's a pleasure for me to introduce this uh, series of uh, webinar, which is called Co-Work from Coherence Workshop. Um, this is an idea that uh, started already about a year ago um, with uh, Edwin Foden when he was uh, a guest at Lund University. Uh, so we thought that it would be very interesting to start uh, to make a workshop actually on possibilities to use uh, coherence. And then because of COVID, the workshop was not possible anymore. So we decided to transform this in a, a webinar series instead. Uh, so what is this webinar series? Well, it's, um, as you can see in the title, is uh, uh, dedicated to all researchers intrigued by the exceptional properties of the new uh, sources of which Max4 is one of example. So coherence is the keyword of uh, actually all upgrades of uh, modern generation sources and uh, free electron lasers. Uh, so you can uh, see from um, this, um, you must have seen these uh, images a few times. Uh, on the right, we can see how the brilliance, which is the number of photons per second uh, per solid angles and per bandwidth uh, sources have been able to produce in the last uh, few tens of years. And now this is uh, dramatically increasing with the new generations sources and with the free electron lasers. And on the left, uh, we can see an image of all the actually economical investment all around the world to either build or expand existing facility towards uh, this uh, capability. Uh, so we have decided to uh, uh, increase, uh, to, to create this uh, seminar, the, the webinar series, really to attract more people uh, towards the use of these techniques. Uh, coherent based techniques have been really developing in the last 10, 20 years. So the community around them is quite small, but now with this increase of uh, coherent sources, uh, then there is also need for more brain to think about which science is possible uh, at these sources, at this facility. So this, we hope that we can contribute with this to increase the user base uh, for these techniques. Uh, we have decided to um, focus this series on coherent imaging because coherence can be used also for other techniques. Uh, but we want to focus on imaging, on microscopy, uh, and actually um, uh, we can see that um, these techniques, uh, inverse imaging, coherent diffraction imaging, has been used already for a wide range of applications. So one of the first examples uh, for a 3D imaging was for bone in 2010, but then this has been also used for crystalline uh, biomaterials. Uh, this is, for example, an example in which coherent actually helped uh, to understand that uh, crystals in shells, microcrystals in shells actually are made of very, very small building blocks, which are nanostructured, about 200 nanometers. So it's been quite a revealing study. Uh, imaging has also been used to, uh, to make microscopy of cells, isolated cells. Uh, so this is also uh, a work um, using holography, actually. Uh, uh, microscopy of uh, not only of morphology, of electromorphology, but also of uh, magnetic morphology, let's say. So this is uh, an example of uh, how um, inverse coherent imaging has been used to visualize a vortex, a vortex of spin without, uh, within a uh, cobaltine material. And also, um, uh, it can be possible, it's possible to use coherent diffraction imaging on actually very crystalline samples. This is an example of um, analysis of defect in a nanowire. So this is extremely small object, which is extended a few microns in one direction, but confined within less than 200 nanometers in the other. So this is also quite a spectacular result. And uh, it's more and more extended actually to real life application. This is an example of how the morphology of a solid oxide fuel cell is actually affected uh, by operation. And uh, all the way to the analysis of how uh, crystal defects uh, can develop during operation of batteries. So as you can see, there is a wide range of, uh, range of applications. So uh, we have organized a program uh, that actually uh, makes an introduction to the coherence. So this is what we will hear today from Pablo. And then uh, in the next lectures, we will have also uh, 
uh, introductory, introductory lectures to uh, the technique. So we really want uh, to give an idea of what is uh, the, the, the information that can be ex extracted from uh, such data set and analysis. What are the requests on the sample? What are the limitations? Um, so old speakers, especially of the, of the first uh, few uh, seminars, we actually take care of explaining in details what are the possibilities and the limitation of the techniques. So don't hesitate to ask uh, directly question during the seminars or try to contact the speakers after the seminar or the organizers we will be happy to uh, reply. But now I give the word to Pablo. Uh, Pablo Villanueva Perez is uh, joined Lund University, I think, about a year ago, and is uh, one uh, excellent example of how one can get fascinated by coherent properties. He was studying high energy physics, and then uh, during a collaboration with a, a free electron laser, then he, he, he decided that actually he was really, really uh, excited about the possibilities of coherence. So he, in the next postdoc, um, he went to work um, at PSI with Marco Stampanoni, was introduced to tomography, and then later on he went to uh, um, European x where he continued, let's say, to develop his passion for coherence. So today Pablo is going to give us an introduction to all the concept behind the coherent imaging. Uh, I also know that Pablo likes to be interrupted during his lecture, so if you have questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand. If you click on uh, the participant list, you can actually uh, raise your hand. I will see this and I will interrupt Pablo and I'll give you the word. So thank you for coming, thank you for joining, and I really hope that this is going to be uh, useful and interesting for you. So thank you, Dina, for the introduction. I uh, will try to share my screen. I think you should be able now. Yep. Uh, is it? Can you see the presentation now? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Dina, for those kind words. I mean, as Dina said, I'm uh, going to present during this webinar an introduction to coherent X-ray imaging. So I hope I can give you an uh, overview of all the other talks that they are gonna happen later and developing more further details. Here I give you my email address. So let me change to the laser pointer. So here you have my email address. So if you have any doubts after the talk, please don't hesitate to contact me or you can also contact me via the organizers. So today the talk is gonna be divided in four topics. First, I will try to start from the very basic. So we'll try to describe you how X-rays interacts with matter. And as we are gonna talk about coherent X-ray imaging techniques, I will introduce the concept of coherence. Then I will move for the sources. So I will try to motivate why we are so excited nowadays and why coherent X-ray imaging techniques are becoming so popular. And for that, I will make a brief review of brightness or brilliance. Then I would talk about uh, coherent and phase imaging techniques. And I focus on two kinds of techniques, only the propagation based, but in two regimes, something I will explain later, near and far field imaging techniques. To conclude, I will talk about 3D and how we can reconstruct in 3D objects by using X-rays and coherent imaging techniques. So with that, let's start. Ah, sorry, I forgot. Uh, the references for this talk are the following ones. So I will mainly use this book, An Introduction to Synchrotron Radiation by Philip Wilmot, because it's a good introductory book for people from different disciplines like uh, biology, chemistry, and physics. These two other books, Elements of Modern X-ray Physics and Coherent X-ray Optics are more oriented to physicists, but you can, I also extracted some material from them. So let's start. What is imaging? Well, imaging is nothing more than mapping interactions with a sample. And we do this because seeing is believing. By reconstructing an object in 2D and 3D and seeing its structure, it's easier for in physical interpretations than having just a physical model and interpreted it. X-ray imaging is decomposed in three stages. So the X-rays, which, which are our probe, they must interact with our sample. The photons that they have interacted, they are collected by an optical setup and brought into a detector. The detected uh, signal is then processed in order to reconstruct and map those interactions within the sample volume. 
As you see, there are these three different steps, interaction, optical setup, and processing, and they must be optimized in order to get the maximum we can get. So, for example, from the interaction optimization, we can tweak the energy of the X-rays for a given sample in order to minimize the dose or increase the or decrease the acquisition times. Also, we can different have different optical setups that they can collect the photons in a different ways. And for that, we have imaging criteria that establish which optimal optical setups we should use. Finally, in the last step, the processing, we can optimize it by adding prior knowledge about our sample. Nowadays, we can think about using compressed sensing or machine learning algorithms that include further <coughs> constraints of our sample. Let's go to the main topic. Why coherent or phase contrast imaging? Well, absorption-based radiography and tomography yields to little contrast for light materials and materials with similar atomic numbers. Here you have a slice of a brain from a, <coughs> from a mice, from mice. And the most important thing here is the absorption contrast scales with the atomic number to the fourth power and the energy to the minus three. That means that we will have high set materials. So what set is the atomic number, like let's say gold, we, they will have higher absorption contrast than light materials like carbon, which is the basis of, uh, <coughs> of life, of biology. Also, their contrast will depend on the energy. So for example, if we increase the energy by 10 times, we will reduce the absorption contrast by a factor 10 to the three. So a thousand times less contrast. So therefore, we will play with these two parameters, atomic number and energy. To understand this and how the interactions and we characterize it with X-rays, we have this example. So imagine that you have two waves. These are to represent two X-ray waves or two photons. And one of them uh, goes through a material with an index of refraction, N. This is the way we characterize the material by its index of refraction, which is equal one minus delta plus I beta. Delta and beta are real and positive quantities. Therefore, the real part of the refractive index is one minus delta, which is smaller than one, where one is the index of refraction of vacuum. Beta is a, again, a positive quantity that is associated to the complex part. So how do, what does it happen to our initial photon that goes through the, through the material? So first, what we will see is that the amplitude is reduced. That means that part of the energy of the, pho the photons of the wave is deposited in the sample. This is regulated by beta, which is associated to all the inelastic interactions that deposit energy to the sample. Then we have another effect that we will observe that there is a phase retardation. So if we count the number of periods of the wave not interacting through the sample and the one interacting through the sample, we will see that there is a delay on the number of periods. <clears throat> this is due to the phase oscillation. This is a phase shift that is originated by delta, and this is related to the elastic interactions that they do not deposit those in our sample. <clears throat> let's see with an example. Imagine that we have, let's say, 20 kV X-ray photons. And we go, this material here on the slab is an organic sample, like a polymer, biological material. So basically, I'm at a made of low set materials. Imagine that this slab is around 50 micrometers thick. So when we look at absorption, we'll get only contrast of two per mil, pretty low and difficult to detect. However, when we look at the phase, we'll have a pi phase shift, which is the maximum contrast you can get. So that means that by having high, uh, exploiting the phase and not the absorption, we can have higher contrast and lower dose. And this is the dream of coherent and phase imaging techniques. Let's uh, see a little bit how delta and beta behave. So for that, in this graph on the right side, we'll study delta over beta ratio, which is basically the, related to the cross-section of elastic versus inelastic interactions as a function of the photon energy for different materials. This red curve on the very top, it relate, it, it's about carbon, which is a low set material. Actually, carbon has set equal to six. If you see the ratio delta over beta increases with the energy, and it gets a maximum value above three orders of magnitude enhancement. So by using that, we will have much better contrast than absorption. However, if you see in the second part, when you, we further increase the energy, 
delta over beta decreases. And this is because new interactions such Compton that we are, I will not discuss in this talk start playing a role. If we go to higher set materials, the enhancement delta over beta, it's smaller. As you remember from my previous slides, uh, uh, the absorption contrast scales with set to the four. So we have a higher set material, so therefore the contrast delta over beta is reduced. But however, for silicon, which is the basics of semiconductor industry, still we can get an enhancement of delta over beta uh, around three orders of magnitude. If we go to higher set materials, then we see that things get more interesting. Like for example, for gold. In the case of gold, the enhancement of delta over beta gets a maximum close to 10 to the two. But you can see there are these peaks. And these peaks happen because we have absorption edges within the electronic structure. So that further decreases the enhancements of delta over beta. So by exploiting delta over beta or exploiting phase contrast techniques and coherent techniques, we aim two dreams. The first one is the dream of zero dose when we increase the energy of the X-ray photons to reduce the absorption and use the elastic contrast especially for low set materials. And the other dream is to improve the sensitivity for those low set materials like carbon, silicon, in order to have higher spatial resolution and higher contrast by exploiting elastic interactions versus absorption interactions. So we want to measure phase. How do we do it? For that, we require a quantity that is called coherence. So the way we describe coherence is in two terms we have two kinds of coherence. You have the temporal coherence and the spatial coherence. The temporal component is the ability of the light beam to form fringes with an elevation of itself. So in general, when we have a, <clears throat> a wave, a wavefront doesn't have only one single wavelength, it has a certain broadband, delta lambda. So imagine that we have two waves that start exactly from the same point, one with wavelength delta uh, lambda and one with lambda plus delta lambda. So you see by oscillating, they will start being out of phase till a point where they are in opposite phase. The point where the, these two waves <clears throat> are in opposite phase, we call it the longitudinal coherence. Then there is the spatial coherence, and this is related to the ability of spatially separated points in a waveform to form fringes. The best way to understand this is with the double slit experiment of Young. So, Imagine that we have only the purple point as a source, and this is a delta function, so a perfect point source. When it arrives to the screen where the two slits are, it will produce secondary waves as the Wigen principle dictates, and we will have the purple interferometric pattern. I will not enter in the details, but you can imagine that we have this interferometry between these two sources. We have a second source, which is the blue one, that is displaced from the other one, and imagine it's again a perfect uh, point source, it will produce exactly the same pattern, but slightly displaced respect to the purple one. You can imagine that if we have another point virtually here, farther away, we can have the case where the maximum of the interferometric pattern is when the minima of the other pattern, of the original pattern, the purple one. Therefore, we will lose the capability by having an, another point farther away to resolve the interferometric pattern. Another way to see that in a most simple picture is thinking about the old times light bulbs, the incandescence bulbs with tungsten materials. So these bulbs emit all the spectral visible wavelengths and beyond. And they have a really large size, so therefore they are not also spatially coherent. So if we want them to be spatially coherent, we can use a pinhole to have a really small point source. As you can see, this is not totally coherent because we have the different wavelengths, like the black and the red one, which will avoid the capability to perform coherent experiments. Another way to filter the different wavelengths is to use a spectral filter. For example, here, the red spectral filter that will allow only a certain narrow bandwidth to go through. But again, this is not a perfect coherent case because we don't have the special coherence. So in order to make out of this light bulb, a perfect coherence source, we need the temporal and spatial coherence filter out by using a spectral filter and a pinhole. And this will allow us to do coherent experiments. In a, the way, the most simple uh, scalar way to describe the coherence is by using, by doing the double young slit experiment. And here I present you the, the, the image and the two main formulas that dictate the transverse coherence and the temporal coherence. 
the transverse coherence is given by the transverse coherence length that is basically the lambda which is the main wavelength of our rotation over theta where theta is the angular source width which is seen the way we see from our sample in our in this case the slits the source d over the distance which is this angle theta then we have the temporal coherence that is basically lambda squared over delta lambda, which is nothing more than lambda over the bandwidth, which is delta lambda over lambda. So when these two quantities are relatively large, so we have higher coherence, then we can perform phase contrast and coherent techniques. How does it relate these two sources? When do we have coherent sources? The way to measure this is via brightness. Brilliance or brightness is nothing more than the number of photons per unit of time per millirad per millimeter square per open 1% open bandwidth as Dina introduced before. The open 1% bandwidth is the bandwidth, so therefore this is related to the temporal coherence. The millirad per millimeter square, uh, it's actually the phase space in the two dimensions perpendicular to the beam propagation. The phase space is related to the spatial coherence so therefore we have one term that is related to the spatial coherence and one term related to the temporal coherence. So we can interpret the brilliance or brightness as the measurement of the coherent flux. On the right side, we have a plot of the evolution of the brightness or brilliance. So what we want in order to have coherent experiments and do coherent imaging is to have as high as possible uh, brilliance or brightness. And we're really lucky because this is the figure of merit that we are using to evaluate and improve over the different X-ray sources. So initially, when uh, uh, X-rays were discovered by Rengen with an X-ray tube, they had a low brilliance around 10 to the 7. But after several years, let's say till the 60s, there was an improvement because we have X-ray tubes with a rotating anode that allowed more heat load, therefore we could have higher fluxes. But the real evolution and the real breakthrough of X-ray imaging or for X-ray coherence or brightness, it was when we started using storage rings, which are facilities for high energy physics. But the, as a fact of this circular acceleration, uh, where, the, where the particles are stored, they emit X-ray photons that they could be used for X-ray experiments. Nowadays, we are in a really excellent situation because the new sources like MAX4 are appearing. These sources are what we call diffraction limited storage rings where the electrons are packed to their diffraction limit. Furthermore, new facilities have appeared, X-ray free electron lasers, which further enhance the brilliance from compared to storage rings by nine to 10 orders of magnitude. These facilities, they produce laser-like light, almost like you will obtain in an optical laser. I say almost because the temporal coherence is still not there. Well, let's go to the main topic, coherent imaging techniques. So we described when do we get coherent sources. And nowadays we are living a really golden age for coherence because we have these diffraction limited sources. And this is the requirement to do coherent imaging. So there are many X-ray phase contrast techniques and coherent imaging techniques. Here I gave you a whole spectrum of them and the references, the main references about them. So the most simple way to measure phase is to use an interferometer. So you have a beam, imagine an X-ray beam, then we split it and we have two identical copies. One doesn't go through the sample and another one goes through the sample. So therefore these two waves interfere and then we are sensitive directly to the phase. We can use also another setup that is sensitive to the phase by using a lens and a phase plate. And this is known as Cernike microscope, but I don't have time in this talk to describe it. Also, there are other setups that they are sensitive to the first derivative of the phase, like if you use an analyzer-based technique, like we use a crystal, or a grating interferometer based on a self-imaging setup. These two techniques are sensitive to the first derivative of the phase. But in the context of this uh, presentation, we are only going to talk about propagation-based techniques. So these are lensless techniques where no lenses are used in order to retrieve the object. I will talk about two regimes, one is the near field, which is proportional to the second derivative of the phase, and another one, the far field, where we will be sensitive to the phase. And I will explain you how to reconstruct the phase and be sensitive to that. So let's focus on lensless techniques and propagation-based techniques. 
For that, and to understand these techniques, we are going to focus on this sample here that you have in this corner here. This sample is basically a set of circles. There are the red ones that they represent highly absorbing parts. So you can imagine a Heisen material like gold. And then there are the blue dots that they don't absorb and they have only elastic or phase, uh, phase interactions. The main number to understand the different regimes in propagation is the Fresnel number, which is nothing more than d squared, which is the typical scale size of our problem. In this, this case, it would be the size of the frame where our circles are then lambda, which is the wavelength, and set, which is the distance, the propagation distance within the sample to our detector. By looking at different Fresnel numbers, we can get different images. So for example, when we are in contact, so set is equal zero, we see that all the phase dots are missing and we are only sensitive to the absorption part. If we move a little bit farther away from the sample, meaning that we have a Fresnel number of <clears throat> the order one or larger, we will start seeing that they appear in these rings. Therefore, by propagating, we start being, se being sensitive to the phase contrast or phase, phase artifacts from phase objects. This is because it produces an edge enhancement. If we move farther and farther away, you see that we start having the rings and the rings become larger in size and they appear more or less with maximum and minima. If we move farther away with sets much larger, we get to a regime that is called Farfield, and Farfield is characterized by its Fresnel number being much smaller than one. In this regime, you can see that the rings start interfering with almost all the whole object, and even it became something more blurrier. And in this regime, we have imaging techniques like coherent diffraction image, imaging, as I will discuss later. So the main message of this talk is that by propagating, we can build phase sensitivity, and we have a mathematical way to describe this propagation, which is via the propagator that we, I would use this following notation, H, to indicate the propagation. And this propagator acts on the waves, not on the intensities measured. I said this because there is a fundamental problem, is that our detectors only record intensity. So imagine that on our detector, we have this wave. We measure, we have this wave on the detector, which is characterized by an amplitude and a complex exponential, which has the propagation terms times a phase given by the, by the object. So if we could measure this field, so CF on the detector plane, in principle, we could get the exit wave after the sample by applying the inverse propagator. So by, by propagating what we call Unfortunately, our detectors can only measure the intensity. And if we compute the intensity, which is nothing more than the moduli square of the wave on the detector plane, we will see that we lose all the phase information and we are only sensitive to the um, uh, square of the amplitude, AXY. Therefore, the phase is low, and this cannot be directly calculated or simply calculated from I, from the intensity. This is what we know as the phase problem, and the phase problem actually tries to recover the phase from the intensity measurement I. In, the, in this talk, I will review some, uh, some approximations how to retrieve this for the near and far field techniques. So let's focus on the first technique, near field or inline holography. These are some experiments we recently made at Max4, specifically at Nanomax together with the Sebastian Kalfleisch and Mike Kant. So we exploit the unique capabilities of Max4. Max4 has some special optics that they are called KB mirrors or Kirkpatrick bias mirrors, that they are able to focus to the nanometer scale, the X-rays. After the focal spot, which is the set of position, we can position our sample. And farther away from the sample, around one meter away from the sample, we can position the detector. Here, I show you several uh, positions of the sample respect to the focal spot that I call set one to set five. Set one is the closest position of the sample to the focus and farther away, therefore, from the detector. You can see that, and on the other hand, set five is the, closer to the, the closest to the detector and farthest away from the, more, uh, from, the, from the focal spot. You can see that by moving from the closer to the focal spot to farther away, we decrease the magnification. But furthermore, we have different propagation artifacts because we have different propagation, 
And you can see that the shape of the stars or this pattern is changing also by changing the position of the object respect to the focus. By exploiting these fringes, there, they have, there is physical information with that, and we can try to solve and retrieve the phase by linearizing the solutions. This is possible in near field techniques where we have an interferometric pattern as we do in holography. So there are two main scenarios where we can easily linearize these uh, patterns and solve them. The first one is contrast transfer functions where we assume a weak scattering and absorption object. The other scenario is transport of intensity equations where we linearize the propagator by assuming a small propagation distances. Here in the red areas, I represent what are the phase contributions that they should be inverted in order to retrieve the phase. Okay, let's see the results. So here there is the hologram that we measure at uh, nanomax. And this is the reconstruction by using the CTF approach by linearizing the object. We obtain these reconstructions by using a package that is going to be released soon and it's going to be open in Python. So it's called PyPhase that we are developing in together with Max Langer. So by using this Nanomax microscope, a full field microscope, we could measure the stars with 70 nanometer resolution evaluated by the Fourier ring correlation. In fact, this resolution is the maximum we could achieve because it was the diffraction limited given by the focal spot of the KB mirror. One can also aim to get 3D reconstructions by rotating the sample, and as I will explain later, we can do it. And we did those experiments at Nanomax by obtaining 3D X-ray microscope of cellulose fibers. We managed to get reconstruction of cellulose fibers with 124 nanometers, estimated again by a method called Fourier shear correlation, and the diameter of the cellulose fiber is 10 micrometers. So let's go to Farfield and look at CDI and tachography. So in the far field, we also can perform phase imaging experiments. But in that case, the propagator becomes the Fourier transform. So if we Fourier transform our sample and we calculate the modular square, that will give us the intensity we will measure in our detector. As I said, we only measure the intensity and we have lost all the phases. How do we retrieve the phases from this intensity measurement in the far field? There are several algorithms, mainly iterative ones, that they are capable to reconstruct that, and they operate in the following way. Let's imagine that there are two spaces. One is the Fourier space, where our detector is measuring, and we have a diffraction pattern, and we have an intensity measurement. And then there is another space, which is the real space where our object is sitting. To move between one space and the other, we can propagate the wave by basically Fourier transforming, an inverse Fourier transforming. So let's imagine that we start with the intensities we have measured, and we add random phases to them. Then we can inverse Fourier transform to go to the object domain. And in the object domain, we can apply some constraints and prior knowledge we have about our sample. We can imagine, for example, that we have a finite support. So our object is only constrained to a certain area of our, uh, our image, and the rest we can set it to zero. We can also have other constraints like can be positivity constraints, histograms, because we know our phase should be constrained within several values, etc. So once we apply these constraints, we Fourier transform to go to the detector space. But when we look at intensities that we get after one loop of this iteration, they are not at all the intensities we have measured. So what we do again is we reapply the intensities we have measured in our detector. Then we inverse Fourier transform and we again apply the same constraints in the object domain and we Fourier transform and we keep on doing this loop till we reach convergence. There are many algorithms uh, based on that. The most famous one or the initial one is error reduction by Gerber and Saxton. But one of the most popular ones that avoids stagnation is by FINAP, which is called hybrid input output by the uh, ends of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. The first demonstration of coherent diffraction imaging with X-rays was done by Miao in 1999. So here I show you an example how it works. Imagine that you have a phase object. This is our reference. And when we propagate to the detector, we measure some amplitudes or intensities. The amplitude is basically the square root of the intensities we have measured. Then I will show how it appears the reconstructed amplitude, the reconstructed phase, and the current reconstruction. So, oops. Sorry, it seems the video doesn't want to work. Uh, 
so I see that I have a problem with the video, but eventually what we do is we iterate over this cycle and eventually in the reconstructed amplitude, you will get the sample. We, we simulate it. Hello? Yeah? I think if you go out to the laser pointer, I think you have to go out to the laser pointer and then you can click on the video. Try that. Uh, yes, but uh, I actually made it to make it automatic okay. and uh, <laughs> to make it in the presentation, but I see that I get uh, an error that says, um, that says it cannot be played. Yeah, can, okay, sure. cannot media be played. Oh. So I don't know, it's, it's something I, I detected this morning that uh, sometimes when I was reloading, I tried to reload it, but I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know why it works. It was working when we tried this just before now. So let's say we have the beam side. This is, uh, what can we do with coherent diffraction imaging? So at these uh, lensless techniques, we can go to, diffra uh, to diffraction limited uh, resolutions, which are given by the wavelength. So for example, here they had this experiment with CDI where they have a beam uh, of a site around one micron, and they had an object, which is a gold nanostructure of a hundred nanometers. So here you have the diffraction pattern and some of the reconstructions. By using uh, uh, some studies, actually half period resolution they did here, they managed to evaluate the resolution to be uh, three nanometers. So this is far away from the wavelength, but still we can get really high resolutions not limited by the optics because it's really difficult already to produce optics with X-rays to be capable to resolve three nanometers. This technique is really powerful CDI and nowadays is one of the main imaging techniques at free electron lasers in diffraction before distraction. So by using CDI, we can image particles and nanoparticles in 3D with resolution eventually limited by the wavelength. I will not start discussing this because this is the topic that will be done in the next uh, presentation by Thomas Ekeder. And with that, you see with single patterns, we can reconstruct different objects. The last technique I'm gonna to talk today is about tychography. So tychography was a technique developed for transmission electron microscopy by Hoppe and Hegel in 1970s. Most of the techniques that we are now using for X-ray imaging and coherent X-ray imaging come from optics and from electron microscopy because those uh, sources, they had high coherence and they had to solve these problems before us. So we just adapt them or reinterpret them to the X-ray domain. X-ray tachography is nothing more than a combination of coherent diffraction imaging, what I presented before, and a a scanning transmission microscopy. So if you look at this image here, you have these orange circles that represent the illumination function. So where the X-rays are impeaching our sample for different illuminations. So first you illuminate here, and for this position, you record a diffraction pattern. So our data set is basically a collection of the positions of the probe respect to the object, x1, y1, and the diffraction pattern for each of these positions. One of the requirements of tachography, as is a pseudo interferometric method, is that there is an overlap between the different illuminations. So there are these areas where for the sample is illuminated with at least two different probes. The good thing of tachography is that we can reconstruct the sample and the illumination simultaneously. So in the case of coherent diffraction imaging, as we don't have this redundancy, we only reconstruct the, the object. And we can do that iteratively, as I described before. So you can imagine that we have the exit wave, which is now the product of the object O and the proposition P, which it changes for every acquisition. Then we Fourier transform, we have measured the diffraction pattern that we constrain, we go infer Fourier transform, so we go to our sample and we update it and we can uh, update simultaneously the object and the probe. And this is what you are seeing on the right hand side, where you are seeing that the object for the amplitude and phase is being updated, while also the illumination in phase and amplitude. Here, oh, this video works. So here you are seeing a scanning process of tachography. So there is the Loon logo, where it's being scanned, and this is the probe position that is always constant, but the object is moved respect to the probe, and for each probe position, we are recording a diffraction pattern. With that, 
we can try to get a reconstruction. So here you can see that the reconstruction of the Lun logo is appearing for the different positions. As this algorithm is reconstructed the different positions in different steps. So in the end, we have reconstructed the phase and amplitude of the object, but also of the wave. We can use tachography and the previous techniques also to get 3D information. And tachography is nowadays one of the state-of-the-art and most popular techniques to do nanotomography. Here you see a setup done at PSI uh, by Mirko Höller, which is Omni. And it was used to reconstruct a whole, uh, in 3D, a whole circuit of a chip of a computer CPU. And with that, they could uh, study all the contacts and map them in 3D without destroying, in principle, the sample, although it was prepared in this way that it was destructive. So with that, I would like to go to the end of my talk. It's about how do we, I mean, X-ray have a high penetration power and they allow us to reconstruct objects in 3D. So let's go to the last topic, which is tomography. So in general, normal X-ray images is, are in 2D. So we have the X-ray, they penetrate over an object and we get a 2D image. But how do we measure 3D? The idea, how do we do it, is we measure at many different view angles, so theta, and reconstruct in 3D all these views. So we can reconstruct this mu function, which is the attenuation. Here I explain for absorption, but analogously, with some limitations, could be done for phase. And now, I mean, the technique to reconstruct from different views by rotating the sample respect to the object is called computed tomography. But how is done this reconstruction? That's what I will try to explain you. We try this a problem of a reconstruction of a 2D image from a set of 1D projections. So let's, I will simplify a little bit the formalism because in, in principle, we will reconstruct a 3D object, but I will follow a salami approach. So what we are gonna study here is how to reconstruct a slice of a salami instead of the whole chorizo or salami. So here is what you are seeing here. You have one slice of the salami where you have these two dots and this, and then for each, angle, we will acquire a 1D profile. So therefore, if we want to reconstruct the whole object, we will just need to stack many of these slices by knowing the order. There is something about the formalism used in these slides. So we use Y as the optical axis. So Y is the direction where the X-rays move. And they, uh, therefore, they produce the attenuation profile, which you see here. So let's assume that we have a function FXY which is basically that it's integrated. So FXY could be our attenuation profile, mu XY, and this is integrated over the X-ray path. So basically in our case, as I said, I use Y as the optical path. So we will integrate FXY over a, this a direction that is called Y. We can compute the Fourier transform of this function P, and the notation is the following one. P capital is the Fourier transform of P, and the Fourier conjugate quantity of X is QX. And the Fourier transform is its typical form described here. Described here. We can also make the Fourier transform directly of the whole object, fxy. And for that, we do a, Fourier, a 2D Fourier transform where we have two components, qxx and qyy. And we integrate over these two components, dx, dy. And with that, we have the Fourier, 2D Fourier transform of our object. Now, let's assume that we study only one slice, the slice where QR, qy is equal to zero. So then f becomes this function here, where qy is equal to zero. So by that, we have this square bracket quantity, which actually corresponds to the definition of px. And therefore, what we are computing in the slice qy equals zero of our 2D Fourier transform is the Fourier transform of p, pqx. So what the conclusion is, the Fourier transform of a projection along a line which we define as pqx, is equal to the slice of the full, full function, so f, with a slice qy equals zero. So you can imagine that by taking projections over different directions, we will build all the slices to complete the whole 2D Fourier transform of our object. And by inverse Fourier transforming, we will get the reconstruction of our object. This is the idea of tomography, and I will try to further explain it with more examples. So imagine that we have this square, this square object and our X-rays move with this red, uh, green line through the red object. And this is the transmission. And if we Fourier transform it, we will get this. So from left to right, we have the Fourier transform, but we can directly Fourier transform all, all of our object. 
And basically, by integrating in this direction, we are studying only the semi-transparent red area, which intersects our Fourier transform. So therefore, we have this. By rotating the object, we can complete this whole 3D, uh, 2D volume, sorry, in this case, with the Fourier transform, and therefore, we can reconstruct our object in 3D. So the real situation is that we don't know the object as before, so we have to measure a set of projections. So for each projection angle, theta, we get a 1D function of, and the position of the detector. And this 1D function is what we call the Radon transform, which is the integral of the X-rays through our sample in, the, in their path. So this will create a 2D data set, which is basically this path integral within for each angle, which is called the Radon transform of the object. So if we make the 1D tra Fourier transform for each angle of this function, and then we do the inverse Radon transform, which is a kind of inverse Fourier tra uh, transform. I said a kind because I will explain later some things I didn't explain. We get the rec 3D reconstruction of our object. The real algorithm has other ingredients because as we are describing the problem in polar co uh, coordinates, but so therefore we have to make the transformation between polar and tomographic coordinates. And here I have a video to try to explain you how it works. So on the left is the sample position and the X-rays come from left to right. This is the 1D function that will measure for a single slide. And this is the sinogram that we will build or the Radon transform for all the angles. So here you can see how the sample rotates and for each of the rotations we have some transmission function and we put it in our sinogram. Once we rotate from 0 to 180, we have a full data set, but sometimes we will require also 360, depending on the sample characteristics for an overcomplete data set. So you see, once we rotate 180, we have a complete data set. Then what we do is we have the complete data set, we compute the Fourier transform of uh, each of these lines, and then we position them in our polar coordinates, or sorry, in our Cartesian coordinates by transforming polar to, co to Cartesian coordinates. So here you can see the video where we are collecting the transmissivity. For each profile, we make the Fourier transform and we position them in our Fourier transform object over the red line for each angle. So once we fill the whole Fourier domain, we will be able to inverse Fourier transform and get the final reconstruction of our object. And this is compared to the original image. So this is the way uh, CT scans work, for example, in hospitals. And here is the example of uh, the typical one you can have in a hospital where you have inside an X-ray tube and an array of detectors. And this is the way it works if you dismount it and you see how fast it works. So then you will understand how noisy they are. So here is the source, here's the array of detectors and then they start acquiring acquisitions. Well, you can hear that some scientists are having fun in the meantime. And yeah, it can rotate quite fast. With that, I come to the summary of my talk. So imagine is nothing more than mapping interactions. We have discussed the effects of interactions with matter, and I try to motivate why it's important to optimize the, the dose and how we can do it by exploiting the phase instead of the attenuation contour. We have introduced the coherent of the concept of coherence required for coherent and phase contrast techniques. We have discussed the coherent techniques without lenses in the near field and far field regime. We have introduced the problem of the phase retrieval and the phase problem, and we have shown a little bit how to solve it for near and far field techniques. And finally, we have discussed how we can retrieve 3D information from 2D measurements. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Pablo, thank you very much for this uh, very, very useful overview on, uh, on coherence and on the possibilities. Uh, I've invited everyone to ask questions. I think that uh, the audience is a little bit shy. Uh, so um, there is one thing I would like to ask you, and is uh, just to talk a little bit about electron microscopy. Why this uh, imaging, this inverse imaging with X-rays should be used uh, and how that compares with electron microscopy? Oh, that's a really good question. So each probe has its advantages and disadvantages. 
So one of the main advantages of electron microscopy is its wavelength because electrons have mass. So therefore they can achieve uh, much smaller uh, wavelengths with uh, lower energies. So with an electron microscope, by having a smaller uh, wavelengths, we can probe a smaller uh, samples. So we can, uh, typical wavelengths of X-rays are uh, in the Armstrong range, which is the atomic scale for hard X-rays, while uh, electron microscopy hatch with much lower energy can have already such wavelengths. That means that in terms of depositing those per contrast, it can go have higher contrast with, um, <clears throat> So have higher contrast and be able to explore uh, smaller resolutions. That's why electron microscopy is now really successful into getting single shot atomic resolution than X-rays because of the interaction. On the other hand, by having much larger, uh, much larger cross section or interactions with matter than X-rays, so less penetration power, uh, there is the problem that we cannot penetrate that much. So typical penetration lands of electron microscopy are around hundreds of nanometers. So that means that we have more restringent samples that we can use. So samples larger than 100 nanometers should be pre-processed or destroyed to be studied in transmission electron microscopy. So there, so as I said, there is this balance between electron microscopy being capable to have higher resolutions and higher contrast than X-rays for a given dose. But on the other hand, uh, they cannot penetrate that much, and therefore we have to cut our sample. And X-rays, as I said, they have the potentiality to go to the atomic resolution, and we can do it in crystallography and in some cases. But on the other hand, uh, they have higher penetration power. So they allow non-destructive imaging, which is not possible for large samples with electron microscopy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, it's important the compatibility with sample environment especially hard X-rays can penetrate uh, sample environments so they can study samples. Uh, exactly, exactly. So one of the main advantages and what I would say that where people should focus on X-rays and not electron microscopy is in, in situ and in, operando, uh, in situ experiments, operando conditions. These kind of things are not in general possible with electron microscopy. There are some exceptions, but few. Okay, so Pablo, may I ask you if uh, anyone in the audience is interested in uh, contacting you uh, privately to ask you more questions about this talk, if they can do this? Yes, I would be happy. And the last thing is uh, that uh, during your talk, you have done some nice introduction about CDI and tachography, but I'd just like to remind everyone that there will be uh, two seminars dedicated to CDI. Uh, for crystalline and non-crystalline samples, and one dedicated to tachography. Uh, so this uh, topic uh, that uh, Pablo touched lightly during this introductory talk will be actually um, uh, developed much better. So I really invite you, uh, everyone who is interested in this, to join us again. The full program is on the LINKS webpage. Uh, for now, we have uh, five seminars planned, so there will be one per week. Uh, so it's very, I'm very happy that we can put together this program. There is one last thing I would like to ask everyone before leaving this chat, if you could just send me uh, short information about what is your interest, uh, what is the topic of research, or what is your interest in this coherence seminar series, because the program is still in theory. We are, it's still um, possible to tweak it to the preference of the, of the audience. So uh, if I have a, a high request of people uh, asking for imaging application, for example, in biology or in uh, technologically relevant samples, maybe we could invite somebody who can answer more specifically those questions. And uh, well, I'm also happy to see that uh, there are lots of people still 17 online. We have guests from USA, Brazil, UK, and actually several Swedish universities. So uh, we really hope that this is a good way to gather more interest around these techniques and uh, maybe seeing you as users at Max4 in the near future. Uh, so thank you very much for this first day and I'll give you an appointment to the next uh, uh, seminar, which I think is the 22nd of August. Thank you very much. <laughs>